morning, Searchlight Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us, the church online. Right where you're at in your home, just clap your hands and let's sing along as we worship the Lord together. I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash I was born again. Forever safe in my Savior's hands. You are more than my words could say. I follow you, Lord, for all my days. My eyes follow in your ways, forever free in unending grace. Come on, sing it out. Oh, you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. You love, you love, you love, ever ending. Oh, oh, oh. You are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. You are all. today. God, we just exalt you and we thank you for everything that you're doing in our church in the midst of all of this. We continue to worship you and you alone in Jesus' name. and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break, broken hearts declare His name. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's a roaring Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. 
His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him Open up the gates up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save, the God who comes to save, is here to set the captives free. Oh, who can stop the Lord? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's a roaring.
gone silent before him. Do you hear his voice as he's crying out to the whole world, come to me, come to me, you who, who labor and are overworked and overwhelmed, raise your eyes up and walk towards me. That's what God has called us to this day. And when everything else has gone silent, it's time for us to realize that he's calling us. God is calling out to the whole world, saying, look to me, and I will deliver you. Look to me, and I will give you peace. Look to me, and I will give you eternal life. And if you're looking for that this morning, just raise your eyes to him and begin to talk to him. And as this world begins to turn a little closer each day to the coming of the lion and the lamb. I hope that we find all of us wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So as we go to prayer, let's make that our priority, that we would look to him, that we would in this time where the world has gone silent, that we would take advantage of these moments when the white noise is turned down and maybe we can see him a little clearer. Father God, we come to you this day and we just ask God that you'd move upon us with your spirit, that you'd touch us with your power. God, that you'd make us aware of you, God. Lord, make us aware of you, God, that you are in all things. And Father, someday soon, you, the creator of all things, is going to come back to your creation. And, Father, may we be found wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, clothed in the blood and forgiveness of sin. Wherever you are this, this day, hear the voice of God calling to you to come unto me. And no worries, for I love you with an everlasting love. Father, we give you thanks for your presence in this place. Lord, let us continue to worship you, for you are worthy of all praise and all thanks. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. Let's continue to worship him this morning.
right in your home, just lift up a shout of praise to God. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love that's never ending. Be with us for the rest of this service this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel, and let me take a moment to say welcome to Searchlight Church Online. Thank you for joining us here on Facebook and on YouTube. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad for the technology that allows us to continue learning, growing, and reaching people for Jesus. It's so good to know that while the church buildings are closed, the church is still open because we are the church. First things first, since we're not physically all together this morning, there's obviously no connection card for you to fill out. So while you're watching this service, take a moment to let us know you and your family are here by writing your name in the comments below. Also throughout the service, write any prayer requests or positive remarks that you would like to share. If this is your first time being part of service with us, write a comment letting us know and we'll be sure to reach out to you personally to welcome you. Also, We'd love to send a note home thanking you for coming to church online. Just let us know it's your first time and one of our pastors will be in touch. Lastly, if you'd like to help out in any way, let us know in the comments that you are interested in learning more about serving on our dream team. There are tons of areas where you can help out and we'll be sure to find something that's just the right fit for you. Even though we're going through this tough time, there are still some awesome things happening at church. Here are a few things to take note of. First, we're getting close to wrapping up our series of online devotionals on 21 days of prayer. There's still one more week to jump on board and get your daily dose of encouragement through these 10 minute videos. If you wanna join in, just go to our Facebook or YouTube page any weekday at 10 a.m. and follow along. Also, if you missed the first few weeks, you can find all of the past videos there. Speaking of online devotionals, we are excited to let you know that when this current study plan is over, look out for a seven-day study on God's plan for dealing with anxiety. We hope more of you will join us as the weeks continue. Lastly, on Wednesday, April 29th at 7 p.m., we will be having our first online worship and communion service. This online event will last about 30 minutes and will consist of some acoustic worship, prayer, and an inspirational time of communion together. Here's how it's going to work. We'll provide the worship and the message. All you have to do is join us online and prepare your own juice and bread for the communion. Well, that's all for the announcements. At this time, we want to bring our tithes and offerings back to God through online giving. Even with the coronavirus outbreak, there are still three ways that you can give at Searchlight. First, you can give cash or check by putting your offering in an envelope and mailing it to the church office. The address is Searchlight Church, 1 Main Street, Street Suite 203, Eatontown, New Jersey, 07724. You can also give through PayPal on our church website. And you can use the Tithely app and give right from your smartphone. If you don't use online giving yet, this is a great time to start because we don't know how long this season of meeting online only will last. And even though we are not physically meeting in a building, the expenses of the church will continue to be a reality. So, after we pray for the offering, go ahead and send in your online tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you for helping us reach and teach people to live and love like Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for being here with us. Even though we are not physically together, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to meet together, to praise your name, and to thank you and to hear your message. We pray that you'll take this offering and that you will use it to continue to help people to... Um, Come to your name, Lord God. We just thank you so much for the opportunity and for how much you've given us and for the opportunity for us to give back to you. In your name we pray, amen. Now let's give it up for Pastor Chris as he brings part two of You in Five Years. Hey, 
Good morning, Searchlight Church. Welcome to Church Online. Listen, whether you're watching on Sunday morning in place of our regular in-person gatherings, or you're watching this days or even weeks later, we hope that you feel welcome and that you know that you're loved today. You know, it's, it's hard to believe that this is our sixth Sunday of meeting online and not in person. And I was thinking about this week, you know, there's a lot of things that I, um, that I really don't like about meeting online, right? For, I mean, for starters, I miss the energy and the excitement when we have a full house of people, whether it's in Long Branch or Ocean Township. I really miss FaceTime. I mean, I am overdue for some in-person hugs and, uh, and smiles. And I'm, really, I miss watching people take their next steps in their spiritual journey when we have church together here. But, you know, there are also some things that I really, really love about church online. For starters, I don't know about you, but I love going to church in my pajamas. I mean, I love being in church in sweatpants on Sunday morning. I like preaching and drinking coffee at exactly the same time time, which is impossible for me when we're here. You know, like right now, actually, when you're watching this, I'm actually drinking a cup of coffee right now and speaking at the same time. Impossible if we were in person. Another thing I really love about meeting online is that more people are being exposed to the church around the world because of the coronavirus. You know, each week, close to 6,000, we have close to 6,000 interactions on our Facebook page by the end of the week. That's people liking, commenting, sharing what they see through social media, and that's all happening because of the coronavirus. You know, the only other time that that happens during the year is like the week leading up to trunk or treat or uh, the egg search. It's the only time that that happens, and so we're experiencing that. Here's the coolest thing about church online. Two weeks ago on Easter, just under 70,000 people across the globe indicated that they accepted Jesus for the very first time in their hearts. And you know what's crazy? All the church buildings were closed that day. Truth is, it's amazing what God can do in and through whatever we go through as long as we surrender it to him. So as long as this goes on, guys, let's put our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, and that he'll do everything that he wants to do through this season. Ephesians 3 puts it this way, and you don't have it in your notes, but I just want to give you this freebie. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Infinitely more God's going to do through this. So if you're discouraged this morning, if you're tired of this season, if you're worried and stressed about finances or health, I want you to put your trust in God. He is at work in you and in me during this season, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. You can take that to the bank. So before we go any further this morning, let me just ask you right where you're at to bow your head, close your eyes. Let's pray and invite God to have his way in this service this morning. Just just bow your head. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that even in the midst of this craziness, you are still working and doing things beyond what we could even think or we could ask. So God, would you just take my words today anoint them and use them uh, as they fall on the ears of anyone who's tuning in and have your way. Make us more like you today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week, Pastor Tim did an awesome job kicking off a new teaching series that we're calling You in Five Years. Now listen, I would love to tell you guys that we planned this series because of this pandemic and because we wanted you to be thinking forward instead of being right here in the midst of all of this. Um, And it is true, you know, we really need to make sure that we're looking ahead and not getting so bogged down in everything that we're going through. But let me tell you how cool the Holy Spirit of God is. Every year in January, the staff go away for a couple of days and we plan out all of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout the entire calendar year. And if you feel that this series is happening right at the perfect time for what we're going through, don't thank me, 
Don't thank Pastor Tim or Pastor Jim, but thank God, because that's how good God's Holy Spirit is. God is not taken by surprise by anything that we're going through, and he placed this series exactly where it needs to be right now for this season in the world. So what do you want your life to look like in the next five years from now? Will you simply be an exaggerated version of what you are today, or will you be different in five years? Will you be more like Jesus or less like Jesus in five years? Listen, I believe that you have a lot to do with what you'll look like in five years, and that is what this series is all about. So if you downloaded the digital, the digital note card that we provided, you can take that out right now and begin to fill in your, your first point as we follow along. And it's something that Pastor Tim said last week. It goes like this. We overestimate what we can do in the short term, but we underestimate what we can do in the long term. Right now in your home, raise your hand if you have ever set out to, do, to deep clean your entire house in one afternoon and you found out that you made it from the kitchen halfway through the bathroom before you collapsed, right? You overestimated what you could do in the short term. Maybe you're like me and you decided to redo your entire yard's landscaping in one sunny afternoon and you decided to start at two o'clock in the afternoon, right? More than you think, you think you overestimated what you can do in the short term. Maybe we can make it more spiritual. Maybe you decided to read through the entire Bible in a month and you quit somewhere in the middle of Leviticus, right? And you never even made it. We overestimate what we can do in the short term, but the truth is we underestimate what we can do over the long haul. Most of the time we don't realize the incredible power that right decision after right decision can have in the long term. Uh, in the long term uh, over the course of our lives. We also learned last week that if you don't like what you're getting, then change what you're doing. So many times we don't like where we are in our lives, but we don't want to change the way we're living. You guys have heard this definition of insanity that I've shared uh, different times from this platform. Insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. The truth is the results you're getting in your life are exactly what the systems you have created are designed to produce. Let me say that again. The results you're getting in your life are exactly what the systems you have created are designed to produce. So if you don't like what you're getting, you have to change what you're doing. And that's why, uh, and that's why it's so critical, and this is why, because the ways you let in become the ways you are set in. Last week we learned that God's ways are not our ways. They're higher than us, but all too often we only let in our ways instead of his ways. And over time, the ways we let in become the ways we are set in. So how do we avoid that? I mean, how do we change the ways that we let in so that five years from now we're not just an exaggerated version of what we are today? Well, today, I want to share with you, and this is your next fill-in, three steps to becoming the you God desires in the next five years. And I want to walk you through these steps by looking at the relationship between two people in God's Word, Elijah, perhaps the greatest prophet uh, in all of Israel, and his servant slash successor, Elisha. And we can find their story, the story of their relationship in First and Second Kings. And we're going to be looking at just a few passages of Scripture today. And as, as we read those, I think this relationship kind of unfolds like a play that has three acts in it. So grab your Bible or your smartphone with me this morning and go to First Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 21, and let's dive into this together. First, uh, actually starting in verse 19. So grab your, your Bibles and follow along with me. The verses will be up here on the screen as well. But first, let me give you a little bit of background before we jump into this. Elijah um, was a pretty amazing, amazing prophet, and his shoes were enormous for someone to fill um, I don't know if you've heard about him or not, or you read about him, but he was the guy that spoke on behalf of God and brought the gr a great drought and famine that lasted for over three years. And then he spoke again and he brought the rain back. This is a guy that was literally fed by ravens. I mean, like 
literally ravens were sent by God and dropped food for him to eat. And then he was a guy that called down fire from heaven that consumed a soaking wet offering and killed hundreds of the prophets of the false god Baal. And along the way, God spoke to Elijah and he told him that he was going to have a successor. He told them that, that Elisha was going to follow him and, he, and he, God sent Elijah to find Elisha and speak with him. So let's pick up in verse 19. Here's where we find out kind of the beginning of the first act of this play. Picking up in uh, 19, this is what it says. It says, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Let me just stop us right there for a moment and give you some understanding from the scripture. 12 pairs of oxen, that's 24 animals. What we can take away from this, guys, as we look deeper into the scripture, is that uh, Elisha's family was wealthy. How much land did they have to have to need 24 oxen to be able to plow with? They were enormously wealthy. They had great crops. And so this was the kind of life that Elisha had. He, he was the one that stood in line to inherit all of this great property and great prosperity. And he was working for his father. Let's pick it up here. It says, Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Kind of a weird thing to happen. Elisha is there. He's going about his day-to-day -day business. And along comes Elijah, finds him, just walks up to him, throws his coat over his shoulders, and then walks away. But something significant was happening. See, Elisha knew that most of the time God uh, used his prophets, uh, had his prophets use symbolism in order to communicate things that he wanted to say to his people. And there was something significant about Elijah coming up and putting his coat over the shoulders of Elisha. So let's keep reading. It says, Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go to be with you. And Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. See, Elisha knew exactly what was going on. He knew that Elijah was communicating to him, I want you to come and be with me. You know, Elijah was famous. I mean, people knew the miracles that he did. They knew the type of man that he was. And, and basically, Elijah was saying to Elisha, this is your opportunity to follow me close up not just from far away, to actually come and be my disciple and learn from me and walk alongside of me as I do these miraculous things. And Elisha was all about it. Check it out. Let's pick it up in verse 21. It says, so Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast the flesh. He passed around the meat uh, to all the townspeople and they all ate and then he went with Elijah as his assistant. And that really is the end of act one of this three-act play. And so we move into act two, and act two lasted 18 years of, uh, of Elisha's life. 18 years. And the reality is, for 18 years, as Elisha followed Elijah around, we only get a very small glimpse from Scripture of actually what happened. 18 years wrapped up in only one verse. Turn over to uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, just for a moment, and we'll see what exactly happened over those 18 years in Act 2. Let's take a look at verse 11. It says, But King Jehoshaphat of Judah asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord with us? If there is, we can ask the Lord what to do through him. One of King Joram's officers replied, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to be Elijah's personal assistant. Elijah's personal assistant. You know, another translation says that he was the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. 18 years having left his family's prosperous business, following this prophet, and all he did was wash his hands. You know, it's almost like all he had to do was be the, the personal hand sanitizer for the prophet. Can you imagine that? 18 years of following him around, every meet and greet, every miracle that he did, his job was just to squirt a little hand sanitizer for the man of God. I mean, if it were me, I would be wondering all that time, is this what I left everything for for 18 years? No miracles, no miraculous things to do, just to follow him around and be his personal assistant. 18 years in one verse, 
for act two of this play. But then we go on to act three. Just go back a little bit. Second Kings chapter two. So we started with the two of them meeting. We find the middle act, 18 years of what happened. And now we find the time when Elijah is going to pass the baton on to Elisha. 18 years that Elisha has served Elijah. And let me, let me tell you what's, what's happening here. Um, God has made it clear that Elijah is done, right? And everybody knows it. And Elisha has never left the side of Elijah. And so a couple of times back and forth, Elijah says, listen, I got to go and do this. Why don't you stay here? Elisha says, no way. I'm not, I'm staying with you. I know this is the day that you're going to go up into heaven. And so I'm going to be with you. And so a couple times that happens and uh, it comes to a place where the two of them have to cross the Jordan River. And so they walk to the Jordan River, and something amazing happens. Uh, Elijah takes off his cloak, he takes his coat, and he slams it down on the water, and the Jordan River parts in half, and the two of them literally cross the Jordan River on dry ground. Let me pick up where we go from there. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 9. It says, When they came to the other side, Elijah asked Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. Of all the things that Elisha could have said after 18 years, he said, just give me a double portion of what you have experienced in your life. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I'm taken away from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elijah tore his clothes in distress. He was mourning. I mean, they spent... 18 years together, so many experiences together, and he tore his clothes. He was sad. He was broken. He was showing respect for the man of God that just disappeared into heaven by a chariot of fire. Then look what it says. It says, Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. So other words, Elijah takes off and from the sky drops Elijah's cloak, a cloak, and Elijah picks it up. It says, then Elisha, Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then the river divided and Elisha went across. Guys, realize what's happening here. In, over the course of 18 years, Elisha went from plowing his father's fields to the prophet of God over the nation of Israel. I wonder if 18 years earlier, Elisha saw his life this way. I bet when he was working for his father in the fields, he saw his future as owner of the property, but God had different plans for him. So how does this affect you and I? How does this story, how does this relationship that spanned 18 years affect us? Maybe you're watching today and you're unhappy where your life is right now. How is it going to be different in five years. Maybe you're not pleased with the relationship, your relationship with God. How's it going to be different in five years? Maybe you're not happy in your marriage or your dating life. How will it be different in five years? You fill in the blanks. It could be kids, career, health, debt, any of those things. When you look at your life right now, how does this story affect how it's going to be different? And I think, honestly, there are three steps to becoming all that God wants us to be that we can learn from this account today. And quickly, I'm gonna give you all three of those this morning. The first one is this, it's drastic action. If you truly want your life to be different in five years, it has to start with some sort of drastic action. And I found in my life that crisis often creates the best opportunity for drastic action in my life. Crisis often creates opportunity. When we go through times of crisis in our lives, the opportunity to take drastic action becomes obvious and often 
necessary. How many of you have ever heard uh, stories of um, people getting superhuman strength when they're faced with a crisis, right? Like a parent in a moment of panic lifting up a car just enough for their kids to escape, doing something that they thought they could never do, but in a moment of crisis, they did. How about a bystander witnessing a horrible car crash that finds the courage to run towards those flames and pull someone out before it explodes? I would say that's pretty drastic. Most of us think we would run the other way, but something happens in crisis. Right now, guys, we're living in it, right? What a perfect example of this pandemic. It's caused some pretty drastic changes in our lives, right? If you would have been asked uh, months ago, could you ever stay at home and not see your friends and your family for months at a time? You would say impossible, but the crisis that we're in caused, called for drastic action, right? If somebody said, you know, you're going to need to wear masks and gloves everywhere you go, you would say that's crazy. But this crisis brings about an opportunity for drastic action. Meeting online instead of in person, if you would have asked me that months ago, crazy, drastic action. And it was no different for Elisha. His crisis wasn't necessarily negative, but it was still a life crisis, right? He was plowing his father's field like he had done hundreds of days before. He was living the good life and probably expecting to inherit everything. And in walks Elijah, tossing his coat over his shoulders and basically disrupting his life plans and throwing him into a crossroad and a crisis. These are what I would call external crises, right? And they tend to create in us a reaction. Oftentimes, external crises in our life create reaction. Maybe it's a health scare in your life, and it caused you to take drastic action and change your diet. Maybe it was finding out that your spouse was cheating on you, and so kicking them out of the house or demanding counseling was a drastic action. Maybe it's even a good thing. How about like your wedding day is approaching, ladies, and you need to fit into that dress I would call that a crisis, right? And so what do you do? You eat celery and you drink water and you run five miles a day for 30 days. I don't recommend it, but it's pretty drastic action that you do to fit into that dress. But does that mean that we can't begin the process of change in our lives without some sort of external crisis? Do I need to cause a health scare every time? I need to get a little bit healthy, not the best plan. Sometimes, Rather than the crisis coming from outside of ourselves, we need an internal crisis, which then creates action instead of reaction. Let's go back to the life of Elisha, uh, Elisha for a moment. How many of you think, uh, when you heard this story, that killing the oxen, building a bonfire, cooking the meat, and feeding it to the townspeople was a pretty drastic action in his life? See, I think Elisha felt that this opportunity to walk alongside the greatest prophet of all time required some drastic action if it was really going to happen in his life. In essence, Elisha was burning the ships. Those animals represented his old way of life. And when he destroyed them, it was drastic. And he was saying, retreat is not an option in this season of my life. It doesn't say anywhere in the text that Elijah required Elisha to kill those animals or burn the plows. It was an internal crisis that Elisha had in his life and that pushed him to drastic action, which brought about the first steps in his life change. So here's the question. Why is drastic action so necessary for us to make major life change. Remember Tim's video illustration from last week's sermon about the tiny block that had to be knocked over to eventually knock over all of those blocks? Something had to happen to get movement to happen. Listen, no, I, I love a good campfire. I have a fire pit in my backyard. And no matter how good of a fire you build, you put all the kindling together and you get some paper towels or paper in there and you put some little twigs in there and even soak it down with lighter fluid. Everybody knows that you don't get a fire until you have a what? A spark, right? You don't get a fire until there's a spark. Here's the truth, guys. Drastic action is necessary to overcome what's called inertia. We get this concept from Isaac Newton, and he's the guy who discovered the laws of motion. Let me read what he said. Let me read this to you. It says, every object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change by the action of an external force. 
These bricks right here, they're next to me. They're a great example of inertia, and our lives are like that. Listen, if something doesn't happen to these bricks, if something doesn't happen to them, they will likely sit here on this table for thousands of years. But I can take the hammer that's sitting here, I can take this hammer, and I can, I can provide drastic action to change inertia. I can hit these bricks, and they'll fly across this room, uh, providing some drastic action that will change the inertia, right? It's the same thing in our lives. Oftentimes, we need drastic action to start the change that's needed in our lives. Think about water baptism. So many of you that are watching this have been baptized, fully immersed. Other people would say, isn't that drastic? Can't you just get sprinkled? Didn't that happen when you were a baby? But no, you got to go out on the beach in front of everybody, down there in Long Branch. It's drastic and get dunked all the way. Why? Because it symbolizes the beginning, a drastic action that will push us on to the next things in our life. Some of you need to delete some numbers from your phone if you want to be different five years from now. People would say, that's drastic. Why delete them? Because you know you need to make that change to get those blocks to fall over. Some of you need to end a relationship that you're in. It might seem drastic, but you need to do that if you're going to be different in five years. Listen, some of you have a pornography problem and you need to destroy your smartphone. You need to go to Verizon right now, get an old fashioned flip phone that doesn't connect to the internet so you can't access anything on your phone. You need to throw out your computer, get rid of your tablet so that there's nothing that can get in your way. Some would say, isn't that drastic? But you need drastic action. Some of you are going to lose your marriage in the next five years if you don't do something drastic to bring a change, like blocking out everything in your life that doesn't push you closer together but drives you apart. Listen, Elisha did a drastic thing by destroying everything that represented his old life. And if you want to be different in five years, you have to start with some drastic action. But the truth is, drastic action is not enough to bring change over the long haul of your life. You also need steady progression. Steady progression. We all know somebody, you know somebody like this, that has taken drastic action in their lives only to find themselves right back where they were a couple months later. If you have ever wondered why that happens, I think the answer is right here in the bricks that we find on this stage. Remember I said, if I want to break the inertia that's in these bricks, to, all I have to do to cause them to move is to hit them with this hammer and it will break them. But I, I'm interested, what would happen if I place these bri- one of these bricks over my hand like this and I decided that now I'm going to break this brick in half? Let's find out. Wow, that was crazy, right? Look at this. Totally fine. Bricks are broken and nothing happened to my hand. I'm totally fine. The reality is it takes so much energy for this force to break the inertia that literally it had no effect on my hand at all. You would think you would totally break your hand. Why? That's because all of the energy is absorbed in getting the inertia to be affected, right? If we think that drastic action is enough, for us to make changes over the next five years, we're totally mistaken. Think of the space shuttle. It's a great example. The space shuttle, actually, I don't know if you knew this, but it, it, it takes more fuel to take off than it does for the entire mission of the space shuttle. Why? Because breaking free from the inertia of that incredible thing sitting on the ground takes all, almost all of the energy and fuel for it to get up into the air. So how do we keep the steady progression going If most of our energy is used up in just breaking the inertia, here's the key. Long-term change comes from long-term obedience. The truth is there is no mystery uh, mystery next step. Elisha spent 18 years simply being obedient to Elijah. And it's the same thing for us, guys. Listen, here's the truth. Um, reading your Bible and praying day in and day out is how we do this. Going to church week in and week out is how you do it. Staying in a life group semester after semester is how you do it. Staying accountable to someone who can actually help you week after week. Listen, there are no shortcuts. It takes more than drastic action. It takes long-term obedience to see this change happen. 
Epictetus said it this way. I'm gonna, these are a little long. Let me read these to you. It says, no great thing is created suddenly any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig. If you tell me that you desire a fig, I answer that there must be time. Let it first blossom, then bear fruit, and then ripen. There's another guy, Darren Hardy, said it this way, and I think this is so pertinent to the life that we live right now. It says, it's time someone told you straight, you've been bamboozled for too long. There is no magic bullet, secret formula, or quick fix. You don't make 200,000 a year spending two hours a day on the internet, lose 30 pounds in a week, rub 20 years off your face with a cream, fix your love life with a pill, or find lasting success with any other scheme that is too good to be true. It would be great if you could buy your success, fame, self-esteem, good relationships, health and well-being in a nicely clamshelled package at the local Walmart, but that's not how it works. John Maxwell said it this way, improvement doesn't happen in a day, but it must happen daily. Do you want your life to be different five years from now? It starts with drastic action, and it's sustained with steady progression. But the last step, I think, is the best one. This is the best news of the day. After drastic action and steady progression, we get to enjoy momentum in our lives. It's awesome. If you go back to those laws of motion, they go on to say this. They say things at rest stay at rest, but things in motion stay in motion. When I was in high school, I was into uh, distance biking. I, I spent a good amount of money on a really nice bike, and um, I would, it was nothing for my friends and I to ride 20 or 30 miles in a couple hours in a, in a nice sunny afternoon. If you've ever done that, you may have experienced the kind of momenting that's called drafting. In fact, if you watch the Tour de France or any other race like that, you would see it. The goal is you ride super close to the person in front of you, and the, the draft from them and the momentum that they're creating actually allows you to keep up with them using only a percentage of the energy that it would take. It also happens in NASCAR. It, it also happens right out there on the highway when you're driving your car. I don't suggest it, but if you get close enough to a semi behind it, you will actually find that you go further on less fuel because of the drafting. That truck's momentum will actually pull you down the road using less energy, right? Have you ever been in a good season of momentum in your marriage? I know what that's like where it seems like everything is going awesome, right? And just, it, and it just the love is flowing and you just don't feel like you can do anything wrong. We experience those seasons as a church as well where everything seems to be running on all cylinders and everything is good. You know, today you might be looking at someone else's marriage and wishing that you could have the kind of momentum that they have. Remember, there's no quick fix. The answer is not going to be found in running away from that person and finding someone else to have a relationship. It starts with a drastic action, continues with steady progression of doing the right things, and you too can enjoy healthy momentum in your relationship. Right? Do you want that kind of momentum in your spiritual life? It starts with drastic action. Like People might say it's drastic to turn off the TV, get off the computer or the tablet, quit social media, stop watching the news, and, and be drastic. Start reading, start praying, get on some Zoom calls with other people that are gonna help you to grow in your spiritual walk. Do the right things over and over again, and before you know it, you'll have the spiritual momentum that you see in everyone else. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8 gives us like a really cool picture of spiritual momentum. It says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in the NIV trans translation. That's what momentum looks like that God wants for your life spiritually. I mean, when I read those verses, look, it starts with faith, right? It says, uh, add to your faith goodness, right? And then goodness, knowledge, and knowledge, self-control, and self-control, perseverance, and then perseverance, godliness. Listen, our journey starts with faith, and so many times we want godliness to come right away. But look at all the things in that progression. 
It starts with faith and then a little bit of goodness. And then your goodness grows into knowledge. And your knowledge, then you have to have self-control. And then self-control is perseverance and perseverance, godliness. And then after godliness, we really, really know what it means to love like Jesus loves. That's momentum that builds day after day and year after year of doing the right things. So as I wrap it up today, let me encourage you with this, and it's your last fill-in if you're still taking notes today, and that's this. Drastic action may feel unbearable. Steady progression feels uncomfortable at times, but with momentum, you become unstoppable. Unstoppable. Right now, where you are, would you just bow your head Close your eyes with me for a moment, right there in your house. That step alone might feel drastic. You might feel like I'm sitting in the house and it feels weird to do this, but take a drastic step and bow your head and close your eyes and just listen to what I'm saying the same way you would if you were sitting here. It's time for us to do a little bit of soul searching. For some of us, we need drastic action. Is there some area of your life that needs drastic action to spark the change that needs to happen? I would encourage you right now to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. If he's speaking to you, just step out and do it. It doesn't matter if people think you're crazy. Elisha seemed nuts to kill those oxen and burn the plows. In fact, I wonder what his dad thought about that decision. But he knew that there needed to be some drastic action. For some of us, we're good at drastic action, but not so good at steady progression in our lives. Some of us need accountability in our lives if we're going to be different in five years. We need to stop looking for a quick quick fix and start focusing on day-to-day obedience. It's not glamorous. It may not seem fun. Day-to-day to keep at it, but that's where you're going to see a change in five years. We need to repent of our pride uh, and belief that we know better than God and submit to the authority of his word, not just once, but over and over again. So here's your assignment After this broadcast is over, would you join me and take some time during the day to reflect on what God might be speaking to you in this series and start to make some changes in your life. If for you drastic action is needed, then pull the trigger and decide to do something drastic. If steady progression is your area, then decide today to just get it right today and wake up tomorrow with the same goal. And together... Let's become all that God wants us to be over the next five years. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, that you have designed for us ahead of time a destination for us to be. And sometimes we need drastic action. We know it always takes an ongoing progression of obedience in our lives, God, so that we can experience the momentum that you have for us. God, wherever we're at in this journey, help us to do exactly what we need to do because we want to be different in the next five years of our lives. And we thank you for your word that it teaches us so much. Help us to be obedient today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey guys, God bless you today. Have an awesome day out there. And we'll see you next Sunday for part three of You in Five Years. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for Church Online today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was great to be able to worship with you virtually, so don't forget to leave a comment and a like to let us know you were here. And if it was your first time, make sure that you write us a message so we can connect with you. We hope you have a great Sunday. Just a couple things to remember. Make sure you join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. as we wrap up our 21 days of prayer devotional, and we'll be launching a new devotional at the end of the week. So make sure you like and subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss any of the content. And I want to invite you to come join us Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We're going to have a very special worship and communion night. It's going to be an intimate kind of setup where we'll get to worship God and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for joining us for Church Online today. I hope the rest of your week goes as well as your Sunday. God bless you.